Hey guys, before we get into the episode today, Kyle and I just want to give you a major announcement on the Jump Studios front. The beta is live and we have beta users using it for their projects, sending their links to their clients, and it's working really well. And we want you guys to get involved. Kyle, how can they get involved and help us out with Jump Studios? Guys, it's simple. Head over to jumpstudios.io, sign up today, we'll get you on the beta list and get you testing and using out this platform mm -hmm. And you literally can be a part of the process. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you want to see in a, in a CRM system. What are, what are we missing? What are the other platforms missing? Help us create the best platform for you to run, manage, and optimize your creative business. That's it. You hit the nail on the head. Everything we do with Learn Videography is to help you grow your video business, to learn new skills, take that business to the next level. And we embedded all of that into Jump Studios. And now we just need your help getting it going and your feedback. So head on over to jumpstudios.io and we'll see you on the inside. Now let's get on with the episode. Let's do it. Three, two, one. Welcome to Learn Videography, a podcast dedicated to mastering the art and business of becoming a full-time videographer. Presented by Industry Jump. Hosted by director Kyle Loftus and producer JJ Englert. Let's go. Welcome back to Learn Videography, your podcast to learn everything you need to know about becoming a full-time videographer. As always, I'm here with my co-host Kyle Loftus and our special yo, guest yo. for today, Joseph Shaw, a content creator and business owner in Los Angeles. Hey. How are we doing, gentlemen? Man, doing so good. Awesome. Yeah. Good. Amp amped to be on the podcast. I got to listen to a couple of them uh, through the last week and just got me amped to speak with you guys. So, so oh, we're yeah. so, so thankful to have you yeah. on. Thanks for taking the time, Joseph. Um, for our yeah, listeners absolutely. out there, we're going to talk to Joseph today about how he built his successful content creation career, uh, how he built his business, his brand, worked with clients like American Airlines, Cuts Clothing, Google, and so much more. So I'm super juiced on this conversation, but I'm going to hand it over to Kyle to get things started. Kyle, what do we yes. got? Yes, yes, yes. So you guys know the deal, hopefully by now. Or if you're new, we always like to start off with just a little intro here. So elevator pitch style for us here, Joseph. Tell us, you know, just a little bit more about yourself, how you got introduced into this this wonderful world of filmmaking. Gosh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, probably about, well, I'll do more of a broad, broad stroke. Um, whenever I was probably 13, I got my first camera. Um, I got a little uh, mini DV, little film camera, which I actually still have. Super fun to still take on shoots, do some awesome. BCS stuff with. Um, I remember seeing my my dad show me just home videos that he, had, he took or he used to go hunting with his brothers and he my dad was never into hunting but he loved taking photos so i just remember at a very young age my dad pulling out like a big like slide projector and just like showing us these pictures and um i think from then on i was just always very like interested in cameras and interested in the ability to capture something and then um you know, having the ability to edit it and really craft it into a different perspective or showing a different perspective. Um, growing up, my my mom always said I was always the first one to always like share the news. If something happened, I always love like telling my family members or my friends like, oh my gosh, did you hear what happened? So always just was always uh, interested in telling stories or sharing news. Um, and then, I mean, how I got here, honestly, over the last, you know, four to five years was... Um, I think I just got that 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 desire of creating things or camera stuff really like um, sparked again. Whenever I got, I was just getting kind of bored of what I was doing in my, I guess, mm -hmm. so-called career at that point. And I was like, I'm gonna get a camera again. And uh, well, I guess not really a camera again, but I'm gonna get my first camera, and I'm just gonna start taking photos and videos. And um, I mean, guys, honestly, the last few years has just been insane. I think it's really just like through connecting, building new relationships, uh, more and more opportunities have opened up than I've ever dreamed. And, awesome. uh, you know, it's like saying yes to things that you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm just going to go for it. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess to answer the question of where did I come from? Grew up in Oklahoma. Now I live in L.A. And uh, a lot has happened between in those last four to five years. And um I think I've gotten to where I'm at just because I had a passion for creating. So yeah. when did a you little make messy that move? answer, but yeah. <laughs> when did you make um, that move to Los Angeles? 
I, so my wife and I were living in Kansas City, Missouri, and we moved okay. to Huntington Beach, California in 2017, okay. or I guess December of 2016. So did you do it for content creation and filmmaking? No, <laughs> I did not. So um, we had some friends living in California um, in Huntington Beach. My wife is originally from San Francisco. She really wanted to move back to California. I didn't want to live in Northern California. I don't really know why, because I actually mm. really love Northern California now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like now I'm a little bit older and I'm like, dude, like just sitting up like on the coast, some fog, nice, you know, hot coffee out mm -hmm. on the front porch would be great. Um, but at that time, I was like, hey, let's just move mm -hmm. to Orange County. We got friends down there. Heard it's really sunny all the time. That sounds great. So uh, moved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, moved to Huntington Beach. And yeah, that was in yeah, December 2016. So how did you so, um, I'm sorry, Kyle, how, how did you get started <laughs> with the content creation? Like, did it did it happen in Kansas City? Did it happen in Orange County? Like, when was that first step so, where you started making videos for clients? That's a great question. So my first videos I started making for clients was, well, I was working for a nonprofit at the time. Um, and they basically, they asked me, they're like, Hey, we need someone to make videos for us. And I was like, yeah, I don't really know how to do that. They're like, well, hmm. I don't know if this is still even a website. There's a website back in the day called lynda.com. Yep. And it's basically like just tutorial videos, right? They set me up with an account. I started learning how to shoot videos and that was solely just to kind of like fulfill this need at this nonprofit I was working for. And um I I I did that for a bit and then I decided to buy my own camera. And later on we can go into how I got my first camera. I think it's a kind of ridiculous story. But mm -hmm. um got my first camera and the first paid video was for this uh I think it was for this donut brand like donut shop. And they had one of the Jonas Brothers coming in. I were living in Kansas City at the time. The weirdest deal. I get a phone call. They're like, hey, we heard you do videos. Like, we'll give you a hundred <laughs> bucks to come out and just film this video with uh, one of the Jonas Brothers. I was like, oh my gosh, a hundred. Wait, I'm like, wait, first I'm going to get paid. And then second, it's like <laughs> Jonas Brothers. I'm like, all right, let's do this. Um, <laughs> Hell yeah. So I think honestly, after that job, I was like, I, I, I got this. I can do this. Like, <laughs> this sounds like a really cool career. Um, but that quickly, you know, the more more jobs I got onto, you know, the more struggles and hardships you deal with, and then you quickly realize you're like, maybe this isn't what I want to do. Um, so I pulled back a little bit. I was still shooting with friends and stuff, um, but it wasn't until we moved to Huntington Beach that that's uh, whenever I started getting more more around creative people. That's really whenever I was like, um, man, I think I could, I think I could actually make this a career and make this happen. Um, so it wasn't until we got out to Huntington Beach that uh, I really like dove in. Man, yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's super interesting, and and I resonate with that a lot in the sense, and and I hope my friends back home don't don't hate me for saying this, but um, you know, a lot of my friends back home in Ohio, they just don't necessarily have a have an interest per se in like a career or in the creative side of things, you know, it was, it was more, they've, sure. they, yeah. they've always been interested in sports and, and I mean, still me are too. to this day. But, um, for me, that's, that was one of my biggest struggles in Ohio is, is it was so hard for me just to find individuals and people to surround myself with that were actually interested mm -hmm. in the things I wanted to do. And so oftentimes I found myself, I mean, granted, I still love sports, but you know, I, I was doing a lot of other things that maybe I wasn't, as passionate about um as i am about filmmaking yeah. and so when i moved to orlando florida it was just a huge like eye opener for me because like there's just so many people interested in all the creative mm -hmm. arts whether that's theater dance music filmmaking etc and so it, it's just it, it makes such a big difference and so i guess long-winded question is you know i mean how, how how important do you think that factor has been for you you know just being um, a product of your environment, you know, surrounding yourself with um, the right kind of people, the individuals that, you know, make you want to pursue your career, yeah. put in more effort, try harder, et cetera. Yeah, I think there's, uh, I can, there's kind of two things in my brain that pop up. I think that whenever I first got that camera, when I was living in Kansas City, um, I was around the best kind of people because it's like, so I grew up in Oklahoma. And I think that Midwest people are just so kind, right? They're they're very quick to like 
take you under under their wing and like really like mentor you. And I had a couple guys there. Um, one of my buddies, Nathan Happer, he still lives in Kansas City, and he basically, whenever I started showing interest in doing video stuff, he was just like, "Dude, you can come on any set that I do." Like he ended up like fl- taking me on a few travel jobs, and I was just like, "Dude, let me carry your bags." Like I'll I'll literally yeah. do anything. <laughs> And he was kind enough to actually pay me on a few of them. There are some of them that I went for free. But um, so I think living in Kansas City and being around people who were just very, um, they're just very kind and very patient and especially patient with me whenever I'm like, you know, just gung ho, eager to learn. Um, At that time, when I got my camera, I was, I challenged myself to go outside and take a photo or shoot a little video clip every single day and post it on Instagram. So, you know, I think a lot of my friends probably got annoyed of me being like, yo, let's go shoot something. (laughs) Um, So I think in the Midwest, I had people who were very encouraging. I'm not saying I don't have that in Los Angeles, but I think in Los Angeles, once I moved to Huntington Beach, I saw a little bit more of the, the possibilities, right? You're around people who are just, you know, the movers and shakers, the guys that are landing insane clients and working with the, you know, world's leading artists. And you're just like, wait, like, how, like, how do I get to that? And, um, thankfully I've been able to, you know, make a lot of friendships who have allowed me to be on some of those sets. So, yeah. What's up guys. We are back at it with our season long sponsor audio socket, and they have everything you can expect from the best music licensing company search through filters, like genres, moods, durations, tempos, themes, and even the instruments being used. And then when you find a song you like, you just click on the find similar feature and then you'll get a list of songs that sound just like that song. So you can really nail down that perfect song for your video. Guys, you can't beat the platform. We're talking about 80,000 plus tracks and they're adding them every single week. Over 2000 different sound design clip elements you can utilize unlimited licensing and so much more. And guys, look, I know 80,000 songs might sound overwhelming, but that's what the find similarity feature is for. They can easily help you find the exact music tracks you need for your project. There's nothing else to say, guys. Check it out. Links in our bio. You can get your first month free with the plan starting as cheap as $10 a (laughs) month. Let's go. Lego, baby. You have nothing to lose. Check out Audio Socket today. Now let's get back in it. Let's do it. How did you like even make those friendships though? Like how did you go out and network or meet these people? Where, where do you find them? You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. That's a great question. So uh, I moved to, like I said, moved to Huntington Beach in uh, 2016 in December. And at the time um, my, my wife and I moved and it, you know, California is crazy with housing. It was so hard to get an apartment. Um, yeah. I had to land, I had to have a job like show the landlord, like I can actually pay rent. So my buddy was working at a church Mm -hmm. at the time. He was like, we need someone to run socials. You can just do that. So that's how we actually got to California. And, but I found myself being like, well, this church was like great, full of amazing people to work with. Um, But I wasn't around. I was realizing like, man, I really want to be around like the guys in LA who are, you know, like I said, on the sets, on the music video sets, working with artists, fashion, whatever. And I'm down here in Huntington Beach, sitting in my apartment with no air conditioning, just sweating and like, you know, like, what do I, how do I get out of this situation? Right. Um, so I, there was a, uh, I just found myself on Instagram and I was like, okay, I'm just going to go through and try and find like direct. Well, honestly, at that time, I had no idea what a director did. I didn't know what a producer did. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what a DP mm-hmm. was. I'm like, what is a DP? Director of photography. They must take photos. That's what that guy does, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, just no grit. And um, and so I'm I'm on Instagram and I'm just finding people who are making cool content. And I was like, there's no way anyone's going to respond. But I think one night I DM'd like 30 or 40 different creatives, and mm-hmm. uh, a couple of them responded and. Like, honestly, the rest the is kind of history, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, I think that like, I learned quickly that like, um, you can actually make a lot of amazing connections and friendships just by taking that step and taking that risk and putting yourself out there and maybe looking like an idiot, but, uh, some dudes took the chance on me. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit more about that, that outreach to Joseph and, and if you don't <laughs> mind sharing, you know, 
maybe a little bit if you remember of like what you said on that initial message and then like what was your approach with with maybe some of these like first times meeting some of these individuals because I, I think mm-hmm. I think one of the biggest things to to hit on here is is the intention um, especially mm-hmm. when reaching out to people that um, one would consider a mentor or just might be in a, a I guess a higher position or might have better access to better clients etc than than you at this time you know oftentimes I find that people maybe don't approach it the right way um, they might mm-hmm. have the right intentions but oftentimes they're kind of approach it in a way. Um, where it seems like they're they're almost asking like wh- like what can you give me you know less of like what can mm-hmm. I do for you um, so I'd love to know just a bit more of like just how you how you approach those relationships and how you're able to to foster them into something you know where you're getting called out to to direct or DP yeah. on projects yeah so I mean at that time um, like I said my knowledge of the industry was just so small and so tiny at the time I think I was shooting on. I was still shooting on my GH4, my little Panasonic. Nice. And um, I, I think honestly, the message was just like, so not really been thought out. It's like, yo, love your content. Just moved to, <laughs> just moved to California. I have no friends, basically. <laughs> I was like, hey, I, <laughs> like, you know, I was like, I was like hey, I, I'm just like, I, honestly, it was the angle was how can I serve you, right? It was I'm trying to meet people. And what I learned in Kansas City was like, there's always a dude on set that like has to go pick up coffee for everyone. You know, like I didn't, I didn't yeah. know what a PA was at that time, but I was like, hey, if there's any anything you need help on, please let me know. I'd love to come help. Um, and then the other ask was, if you have any time for coffee, I'd love to link up. I I just want to like try and get plugged in. And um, now thinking back. I mean, you know, like I'll have people ask me like, yo, can we get coffee? I want to get plugged in. And, you know, I think I can typically quickly like kind of weed out who I really think is actually genuinely interested in me versus like my clients maybe. Um, But Mm -hmm. yeah, that initial message was really just like, hey, I want to serve you. And honestly, I think that's um, the way that I've interacted with um, other directors and producers is a huge, is the exact same way I interact with clients. How can I serve you? How can I make your life easier? How can I help you get, how can I help you achieve your dreams? Now, obviously a dude having no understanding of the industry being like how, <laughs> telling like a successful director, how can I help you reach your next dream? It was probably really yeah. silly to, of me to say, yeah. but I mean, uh, it, it worked, I guess. You're just down to help. You know, that's the biggest yeah, thing. Absolutely. Just a good personality, good attitude. Just let me know I can help. Ready to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So when did, uh, when did your first like, freelance gig come around where it's like, Hey, I got this client. I'm in, I'm mm. in LA Huntington beach area. Now, maybe your first like real client job. How did that happen? And like, how did you prepare for, for that gig? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, well, how I got to my first client, um, was a little interesting because basically the moments, the moment that I was DMing these guys to try and hang out. Right. Um, at that point, I had never really worked for a client. Like I said, I worked for a donut shop, but I never like shop products. I had never directed anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, how I got landed my first client was I got on Instagram again and I DM'd. I spent one weekend basically going through Instagram and finding emails. And I think I D, or DM'd and emailed close to 500 brands over a weekend. Wow. Um, and my thought process was it. And well, this was before Instagram like capped the algorithms and made things kind of weird. It was still a free for all, you know, yeah. like you could do whatever you wanted. Hmm. And like I was going through and like collecting emails, built out a spreadsheet at the time with one of my friends, his name's Dodson. And we were like, dude, if we just hit up like tons of brands, someone's got to work with us. Now, <laughs> remember, I had never shot a product in my entire life ever. <laughs> so like, you know, I, I don't know what I'm good at shooting. Like, I, I have no idea. I don't even know where I'm going to shoot it. I don't know how to find a model. I don't know anything whatsoever. Mm-hmm. All I know is I want to be a freelancer and I want to be a content creator because that seemed really fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. so I emailed, like I said, emailed all those brands. And surprisingly, um, brands love 
sending you really, really cheap products and getting photos for free. Yeah. <laughs> I learned that quickly. I think I yeah. had 30 or 40 brands sending me stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so from that, my, dude, my neighbors probably thought I was crazy. Like there was a week where like literally boxes every day, multiple boxes showing up to my house and I'm getting the weirdest products like like essential oil. I Dude, I emailed everyone like essential oil. <laughs> I got hammocks coming in. I got t-shirts. I got like... <laughs> girls clothing that I'm like, I, how do I shoot this? Like I said, I don't know how to get a model. My wife's like, yo, this is your thing. This is your thing. Like, I'm not going to model good. that for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so from that, to answer your question, from all that craziness, um, I was able to build a portfolio and a little landing page showing my work, right? And from that, I was able to go back to these brands and say, hey, if you like my work, you can rehire me. Now, not many of them did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there were some that did. And then from that, I was able to start um, working with other brands. And I honestly, I think my first paid client um, was probably Movement. I think mm. Movement Watches. I think that they yeah. were probably one of the first. That's a good one, man. Now, That's a good whenever, one. <laughs> well, when it comes to like products, you know, I've, I did do like a few like weddings here and there, which I learned really quickly and never wanted to do mm -hmm. uh, again. Um, but whenever <laughs> it comes to like, where I'm at now in my career and like doing working with fashion brands or artists. Um, yeah, movement, honestly, movement was, they were the brand that took a lot of chances on me. I mean, I, I even, I know that there's one point where I think their creative director was like, please never hire that Joseph guy again. Damn. <laughs> but luckily <laughs> my, the, one of their, um, like one of their producers who produces the shoot, she's like, no, no, no. Like, I think, I think we can really like craft him into something or, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. Somehow yeah. she convinced them to keep me on. Um, but yeah, movement was, I think my first brand that wanted to actually pay me for photos. Yeah. That's so exciting. When did you take the leap from photos to video? Like what did that then look like for you? Yeah. So, well, I think what's funny is I actually, I saw myself more of like a dude, like a video guy than I did a photo mm -hmm. guy. Um, it didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't really start. Um, well, I just, I thought it'd be easier to, I thought it'd be easier to land clients based off photo than video. Just knowing like the, you know, it's sometimes it's, well, not sometimes it's very difficult to create content for brands, making sure it's on brand for them and stuff like that. And especially that early into my career. The, fo the photo angle was more of like, I just want to get my foot in the door. I want to get one of their products. I just want to, I want to create that connection with them, right? Um, but at that time, I saw myself more of as, as a video guy. Um, and with movement, I I got their their watches and then I just slowly kind of started sneaking like videos into Dropbox. Hmm. I'm like, hey, I shot this on the <laughs> photo shoot too. And then, I mean quickly there they started adding that onto my monthly deliverables they i signed a retainer contract with them and you know i was doing an x amount of photos and they and i started doing little instagram uh videos for them um mm -hmm. so it was, a, it was i i had to slowly get into that with them um because in my head i was more of a video guy um and i honestly like i didn't at that time i didn't even like saying i was a photographer so mm -hmm. and yeah you know Okay. Joseph, it, it sounds like, you know, you're, you're similar to a lot of our listeners here and that, you know, it's a lot of and my, me, myself too, let's be real. You know, it's, it's a lot of learning as you go, right? Like it's, it's oh, yeah. learning through experience. So I'd love to know, like, what are the, what are some of the key characteristics and, and like components um, that you think you have that are really, really important to being able to, to succeed and reach the levels? Because reach the level of success you have, um, mm -hmm. you know, overcoming kind of all the, all the obstacles that, that come with that. Cause you know, in reality, I mean, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to, to, to learn and, and overcome, mm -hmm. you know, did you have a mentor? Did you like read a lot of books? Did you take any online courses? Like what are, what are some of the things you think yeah. you know, could, could really help along this journey? Um, I, I mean, I think a huge part for me was, um, was like I said, kind of offering to people just to come serve them on sets. Um, right. Honestly, like the, the best way to learn was to get experience, right? And that's even if you're a PA, if you want to be a director someday, like, dude, like go, go pick up that crafty, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. because me getting on sets, like it allowed me to be able to ask questions, right? 
Um, it allowed me to kind of step back and see things, you know, how larger sets work and stuff like that. So I think that like, um, like I said, I did some like, I would watch tutorials. Honestly, I would, I would spend hours and hours on YouTube. Um, that was a huge thing for me. Um, just devoured YouTube tutorials on lighting, you know, um, (laughs) <laughs> learning frame rates, all that stuff, but all these camera mm-hmm. tutorials, that was really big. Um, and then I think just like, I, th- I think a huge component is just like admitting that you don't know everything or anything, just always being open to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I have people asking me, I mean, I'm on a podcast right now and half the time I'm like, dude, I get hit up to do cl- uh, jobs for clients and I'll be like, yeah, I can totally do that. And I have to spend like, two or three overnights on YouTube, just like figuring out how to do that. (laughs) So it's kind of like a, I think, I think to sum it up that it's just being self-aware enough and humble enough to just be like, I'm always learning and being hungry enough to actually keep learning. Cause it's easy to get stuck in a rut. It's easy to be like, dude, I'm good. I'm like, I'm cruising. Um, But I think always try and keep learning and being humble enough to accept that you don't know everything. I think that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about your business, um, your uh, brand that you built, Shaw Creative. Mm-hmm. When did that come about? How did you take those steps from, hey, I'm a photographer, now I'm a videographer, a content creator, now I'm building my own brand, my own company. Walk us through that step and you know why you wanted to take that journey and how you kind of got set up with that company. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so... As as I started getting on, getting more jobs, landing more work, directing and producing things, um, I quickly realized I couldn't do everything on my own, right? Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, that took a lot of, um, it took a lot of times of me taking on jobs and trying to handle every role and somehow still accomplishing what I was hired to do, but uh, just feeling you know, dealing with burnout time and time again, because you're taking on too much. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just realized I was like, man, I have to, I need to, I need to, I'm accepting jobs that are bigger than myself, right? Mm -hmm. There, I can't handle it all. So I realized I was like, I have to have a team. Um, So I luckily, you know, just through working on different jobs in LA, I, I was able to make amazing uh, relationships. Like right now, whenever I direct a larger job, I, I have like a go-to guy that I hire to produce almost everything for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think like, I got, I just got to a point where I realized like I need a team, right? I, I can't do this mm-hmm. on my own. And it's, you guys know, it's so much, it's so much better being able to go from job to job to job and like project to project with the same people. You get to learn together, you get to grow yeah. together, you know, my, I have a handful of different DPs that I love working with. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I, I realized I just needed help. So that was kind of the jump. That was in 20. See, I launched, I got my LLC. I think that was in 20. It was actually pretty quick. I got, I filed for my LLC in like 2018. Um, okay. That was primarily for tax stuff, <laughs> honestly. Um, yeah. But, yeah. and I'll say this. So like right now, I don't have like any, I don't have any full-time employees, but like I said, I have a list of all the guys I go to on primarily all of my yeah. shoots and I just try and stay loyal to them and vice versa. And it's been great. So. And, you know, Joseph, you know, when we're talking about needing help, I'd love to talk a little bit more too. like, what was maybe the most difficult part uh, about that process? Um, and what was maybe the easiest part about that process when it comes to um, giving up work, uh, diversifying some of the tasks? Um, Would love to just know some of your thoughts on that. You know, I I know for me, my my hardest part, you know, is just the the aspect of giving up control, but the the Mm -hmm. freedom in regards to time it's provided me is, is immense. And, you know, really uh, you can't really put a price tag on it. So we'd love to just know your thoughts on the process. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think losing control is definitely a difficult one because I think like as artists, we we tend to, I mean, we want to craft a story around the way we want it, right? And the more mm-hmm. people that get involved, you know, that 
people say like there's too many cooks in the kitchen, right? Like sometimes you can get too many people involved and that can be difficult. So I think there is, that was a difficulty having the fear of maybe my creative vision, not always being, um, not always being told the way I want. Now I would say that was a fear at the beginning. Now I've quickly realized like how amazing it is to have a team and people around you who believe in you and right. believe in your mm-hmm. vision. So that was challenging. I mean, honestly, I think the biggest challenge was um, since I kind of offered myself to brands as this one-stop shop, like I'm going to give you Mm -hmm. a campaign video. I'm going to give you ads. I'm going to give you swipe up stories. And as social media has progressed now, I'm like, I'm giving you TikToks. I'm giving you Instagram Mm -hmm. reels. I'm doing photos. Um, I didn't know how to properly bill for things. You know, like right, just, right. I found myself just giving so many assets away and still walking away, basically just not making enough money to, to properly pay yeah. people. Right. Like I look back on like one of the first jobs I like actually directed with the team and I it's just comical what the budget was. And I don't even mm-hmm. know. I mean, I think we ended up having like six models and I had like eight or nine people on the shoot. And I think I think our total budget was like twenty five hundred bucks. I still have no idea how we did it. I mean, mm-hmm. we shot everything completely illegal with like no permits or like sure. down at like <laughs> El Matador, El Here's Matador bucks, Beach. Here's and $100. Like, yeah. Well, yeah, dude. And at that time we show up at the beach and like I'm paying for parking and like I see the sign about like video shoots and permits and I'm like, well, I don't even know what that means. Like what? Why would you need a permit <laughs> to shoot on the beach, you know? And like, so thankful we didn't get caught because then I quickly learned like, whoa, I could have like, I could have gotten a big yeah. fine from that. But I think a huge challenge honestly was like, figuring out how to scale my business and properly bill for the work and for the assets I was giving brands. So, right. Right. Yes. But, but how did you do that? You know, like that <laughs> is so hard. That is, yeah. I like, it's it, difficult. That is a common story of like, you, you want to make a client happy, right? So you give mm-hmm. them everything under the sun and then you realize you really didn't really make any money because you just put in 40 extra hours Mm-hmm. And you made five bucks an hour, you know, something like that. Yeah. Crazy. And then you have like, to explain why you want another three grand on the next project. On the next right. shit. Exactly. <laughs> no, well, and I think, I think there's, there's part of it where thankfully I have been able to work with so many amazing, like locally based LA brands who I've been able to get to know, you know, the employees, even outside of shoots who become friends. So thankfully, like once you become your client's friend, you know, Hopefully I've been lucky enough to where they, they look out for me too. You know, like I've even Mm -hmm. had brands being like, dude, you need to charge us more. You know, that's the dream, Mm -hmm. right? Working with brands who believe in you just as much as you believe in them. Um, And I think that, I think getting to that point is um, it takes time, but you have to foster that relationship. I mean, with movement, I would, I lived in Huntington beach and whenever they started working with me, I would literally like, I would like text my rep and be like, Hey, I'm like, I'm going to be in the area today. I'd love to just swing by the office and say, Hey, I was not going to be in the area. I live 40 minutes away. I would, yeah. you know, like I would like come yeah. up with excuses to like, just show up at the movement office just to go like high five people, even for five minutes, just because like I saw the power of even like uh, building relationships. But like in LA, it, it's LA is very like out of sight, out of mind. Like if you don't see someone, mm-hmm. someone for a while, yeah. like suddenly that relationship is just not as strong um, mm-hmm. where, I grew up in Oklahoma. Some of my closest friends are still guys I grew up with. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But okay. Back to the whole like money stuff, budgets. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes brands are willing to scale with you. Mm -hmm. You know, they recognize you're giving, you're giving them solid content. So they're like, they're, they, they, they're okay with me giving them a budget that's higher on the next shoot. Some of them aren't. So I've ran into it a lot. They're like, dude, why are you wanting to charge us another five grand? Like this mm-hmm. is the same amount of assets. That's the struggle. Um, mm-hmm. I think overall, my, my advice would be like, um, a, it would be like on the next brand I work with, right? I'm just going to set the foundation that like, these are my rates. So it's like, mm-hmm. I think with like every brand, it's like, I'm kind of scaling up. Mm-hmm. you know budget wise yep. maybe even like creative and then i just have to like sometimes you just kind of have to suck it up and deal with it like there's brands that i've been working for for the last three years even movement one of them um you know i think that especially with them they've been extremely generous and kind with budgets with me but at the same time like 
I, I, I was looking at my Dropbox. I think I've done over, I think I've done like close to 50 shoots for them in yeah. the last several years, you know? And, yeah. um, I mean, if they hit me up today and was like, Hey, can you like go shoot this watch photos? This is our budget. Even if it was like way below my normal rate, of course I would do it, you know? Sure. Um, sure. it just comes down to relationship yeah. and learning and growing and learning how to value yourself. Hope that yeah. makes some sense, but no, no, totally. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I resonate a lot with that. I think that's, that's very similar. in in my case, I think the only other kind of piece I had to there was, um, literally just like stupid Google searching, like what is a typical like DP rate in LA? And then, like, I literally would just work my, start working my way up to kind of get to those points. And as you mentioned, you know, for me, I guess, I don't know if I did it, you know, every single project, but I would say every couple months, almost like every quarter, I'd kind of reanalyze and be like, okay, like I've, I've definitely gotten better. Like I don't want $300 for a video. Like I want $500 and then you right. know, continued to kind of rise mm-hmm. up to get to where I am and, now. And no, I think that's great too. I think uh, this might be good for me to share, especially with brands that I have, have contracts with where I do monthly deliverables. Um, I think it's really important to always have, you know, you have that contract last for three, six or 12 months, um, mm-hmm. whatever the, the client's comfortable with. So then you have, you have set times throughout the month that you can reassess all of that. Does the brand still want to work with you? Do you still want to work with that brand? And is everyone getting what they need and want? Is the brand mm-hmm. getting the assets they love? Am I getting paid adequately enough? Mm-hmm. Um, so then if you have that set in your contract that you're going to reassess every three to six months, then it allows room for that conversation without there being any kind of like intimidation or fear. Yeah, I love that. Right, right. And, and I'm curious, Joseph, um, how how do you know or like when is the the cutoff point for you? Um, just you know, maybe for for our listeners' sake here, let's let's pose a, a scenario here for you. So you know, you're mm-hmm. you're two years into your career, um, you have just started kind of making this like a full time gig. You know, at what point do you kind of say no to a client? Um, at what yeah. point do you kind of kind of cut them off, or maybe you know, just speaking from you know yourself and and where you stand now as well? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a, <laughs> I've probably not done super well with that because I know that I have for sure fallen into the trap of of being like, oh my gosh, I'm a freelancer, which everyone tells you, dude, if you're a freelancer, you could go months without work. You know, mm-hmm. like, how are you going to provide for your family? So it's mm-hmm. easy to fall into the trap of like, I'm just going to say yes to everything and like hope that I can get it all done. And there was definitely like two years where I said yes to everything. At one point I had, I had 10 retainer contracts wow. signed where I was doing <laughs> minimum 10 shoots a month. And most of it looked like me doing almost all of it by myself, yeah. which that maybe that's a time for another podcast. That story led to crazy burnout. But anyways, So I think um, now I would say, I mean, do delegate. I think what I love doing is like if a brand's like, hey, can you do this? And then the rate isn't there. I go, give it to a friend. Actually, I have a buddy who's can totally knock this out of the park. And what I try to do, some some brands, I'll just say, hey, that's way below my rate. I can't do it. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I just say, hey, I can't I can't fit that into my schedule. Because what I never want is like, especially if it's a brand that I really love to work with. I don't want them to think that I'm just way too expensive Um, because there might be months where it's slower. Or just all about the money. Yeah, exactly. Like sometimes it's like, maybe I'm just slammed that month, but it's a brand that I've always really wanted to work with, but the budget's not there. I don't want them to be like, dude, this Joseph dude is just too expensive. I want, so what I, what I typically do is I toss it to a buddy um, and then business aspect, uh, you know, just to the listeners, like, um, do do finder fees man like my friends don't care like if i'm like yeah. hey I, I got offered this job i can't take it on let's run it through shaw creative and let's have an agreement that whenever i share about this project you're going to be you're going to get the credit you deserve but when you post it shaw creative needs to be you know tagged as the production company yeah and then i also yeah. sometimes i will still technically executive produce those shoots run it through my llc handle payroll or sometimes I go, dude, I don't have any time for this. I just want 5%. Have it. Yeah. Or sometimes yeah. I say have it. I mean, dude, if the budget's like so small where I'm like, 
I feel terrible even taking 5%. I just go, yo, just, just take the job, you know? Yeah. So I, I hope that answers your question. It, it really varies. And then sometimes there's those brands that you're like, dude, you just want to run from. You're like, I, I don't want to work for you guys. I'm like, <laughs> no, we can't do that. But yeah. thankfully I, I don't run into that often. I remember I oh, had I, a, a shoot where a producer came to me. He's like, hey, I'm swamped at the moment, but I got this Kalani video that needs a producer. Mm -hmm. It's $50,000. You can have it if you give me twenty five hundred of it, and just don't show the label where that went, or like you know, kind of disguise it in there because mm -hmm. I don't want them to know that. And you know, like it worked out great. You know, all of a sudden I got a fifty thousand dollars music video that I produced for Kalani, and that was fantastic. And I was like, hell yeah, I'll take that. You know, on the yeah. other side of it, so I, an opportunity is an opportunity. If there's a finder's fee, hey, I got an opportunity. So I was stoked. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. No, yeah, I I, I love that. I think. Um, I think we've actually talked about that on some of our recent episodes here, you know, just the, the power that that actually has. I'm curious if you have any like, in, like specific stories of when the clients come back to you for like a bigger project, um, because, you know, you, you handed mm -hmm. them off. Cause I think, I think that does a lot, you know, I mean, it, it not just kind of validates your, yourself, um, and allows them to trust you more, you know, giving them someone, mm -hmm. um, rather than yourself, um, just because of timing and convenience sake, but also someone that then yeah. does a great job for them. Um, yeah, but then also like this is that junior guy. You know, if you want to pay a little bit more, you can get the senior. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. So I, I found that that works a lot for me. I'm, I'm curious if you have like any specific stories, or you know, I'm definitely gonna have to steal that that scheduling technique. I, I haven't used that yet, but that's that's smart. I like I like the perception just, that just that too puts swamped. In their mind. I can't do it. Yeah, because I mean, dude, when it comes to I mean, dude, our whole job is like creating perception. At least if I'm me, if I'm shooting for a brand or a product, I have to create content that when people see it, they want to buy it. Right. Mm -hmm. Which sometimes like I have a conflict with that, especially if I'm like, oh man, I don't really even this like product this product, sucks. which doesn't, <laughs> which luckily doesn't happen a lot. Um, but I think that like, uh, to answer your question, as far as when have I sent someone else besides me? And then the client loved it and they came back. Let me think about this. That's a tough one. Um, that's a tough one. I think what's been good as of late is. Um, or has, has any of, of those individuals come to you and hired you for a project? You know, have you had instances like oh, that? So, yeah. So what's fun too, especially in LA, I think I understand your question. The cool thing about LA is um, the creative community is it actually isn't that big, you know? It's really not that big. And what's cool is like, I'll direct something and, and sometimes, you know, it's just, it's friends hiring each other on, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think the, everyone that I bring onto my sets, like do like my go-to gaffer is actually a killer director and he'll hire me to DP, you know? Yeah. And then like, <laughs> like, it's just so funny. Like he's not like, he's literally DP probably like 10 to 15 jobs for me this year. But like, he doesn't even, he doesn't gaff or sorry. He's gaffed probably 10 to 15 jobs for me this year, but he doesn't really gaff for anyone else because mm -hmm. that's just not really what he does. But he's, but as we all know, if you're a DP, you better know lighting. So it yeah. just makes sense that I'm hiring an, a really good established DP to come gaff for me. Now, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people would probably not agree with that, but we, we get along well and that's great. So yeah, I mean, across the board, like there's always that like, oh, you hired me on the job last month. Like I'm going to hire you. But yeah. that does get tricky, though. That gets sure. really tricky. You know, I've, I think I've had to learn that, like, there are, I've kind of had to semi-compartmentalize friendships where I have my friends who I don't work with. I have my friends who I can work with. And then I just have guys that I'm like, we should probably just work together because mm -hmm. we just don't vibe as friends either. So it's mm -hmm. like, because relationships can just get really messy that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can Can you talk a little bit? We'd love to dive a little more into that. Do you, like... Do you have initial conversations or set boundaries when you're first starting to to work with new individuals or, or what does that process look like for you? Because, man, I, I'm sure our listeners have run into it. You know, I've run into it. Mm -hmm. it. It's just the worst scenario when when you guys, you know, people go into a project with the best intentions and then there's conflict at the end. Like, well, wait, I thought I was getting credit for this or, you know, oh, yeah. I, I feel like I did more of this than you. And. You know, like, uh -huh. do you have any scenarios like that? Or, or can you just talk about your process kind of uh, helping prevent instances like that? Yeah, I think, I mean, communication is really key. I've definitely learned to, 
going into any project, especially if it's like a spec piece, because uh, titles can get mm. really messy really quick with yeah. that stuff. <laughs> I think just like, man, it does everyone a favor if there's at least someone in the group that's like, hey, let's figure out these are the titles, these are the roles, but we're all going to give 100% to make sure this works. But you just, before you start on a project, everyone has yeah. to know exactly what their role like is. because the you payment want to, and everything too. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly. I mean, dude, it's just communication. Um, but I mean, yeah, there's been several instances where like a job gets posted and I'm like, huh, I thought, I thought I co-directed that. I guess I'm, I guess I was just the DP, you know what I mean? Or or like, I guess, or whatever, you know, and sometimes I go back and have that conversation. Um, and sometimes I don't, sometimes I just, I just go, you know what? That was a learning experience for me. I'm Mm -hmm. just going to make sure on the next job, I'm going to make sure this is extremely clear. Um, or like I said, before we even started recording the times where you might hire someone on to edit for you or something and um, not setting a clear boundary of like how maybe that editor can use that in their portfolio or anyone on set, mm-hmm. you know, it's like uh, yeah. the world of social media is tricky. Cause I always love anyone who's working on my sets. I want them to utilize the, the content for them to land their own work. Um, but I'm very, I'm obviously a big advocate of giving, giving credit where credit's due, always tagging people yeah. on social media, what they did. So I think it's, um, setting that, uh, setting those not boundaries, the, the but boundaries, just communicating. Yeah. 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 It's, you know, like, um, this is the film business, you know, like this is mm-hmm. a business we're doing this because it's a business, but we are working with our friends. If we're lucky, we are creating really cool things if we're lucky. So there's a lot of blurred lines, but you got to remember that this is a business. You are a professional yeah. um, and this is impacting people's careers. And so you just got to be upfront, just like you said, as, as communicate as much as possible. Hey, we're doing this. This person's getting this rate. This person's getting this job or whatever. This person's being this. Everyone's up to date. Now let's just go have fun. Mm-hmm. Now that we have everything, to, right. you know, um, it's huge. I mean, and yeah, also absolutely. just payment terms. Like when are you going to pay someone? You know, I've had people <laughs> that they thought they're going to get paid the same day and then they got, we were on like a net 30 or something like that and created major rifts or, you know, talent even trying to sue us or whatever. You know, like you got to communicate that stuff so clearly oh. at all angles. I was on a shoot a few months ago and one of the models, it was like we're all eating lunch and he just randomly was like, he was like, yeah, he was explaining something about, Maybe it was something to do with the union. I honestly don't know. I'm not union. Uh, but he he said something about like how he now has a lawyer that goes after people who don't pay him within seven days. And I looked at him. I was like, well, I'm not paying you within seven days. Like, <laughs> I was like, are you going to like, are you going to sue me? You know, so we had, to, we had a fun little chat about that. But. You know, it's, yeah, yeah, people have different expectations and you just got to communicate. But yeah, net 30s are great. I mean, obviously, same day, yeah. pay. if I'm the one waiting for payment, that's great. But if I'm paying out, you know, I got to yeah. I got to make sure I'm paying my it's a cash flow thing. Locations yeah. and, oh, I, I, exactly. hundred um, percent. I think. Yeah. I, yeah. Commun- communication. <laughs> I, had, I had a story that I shared on the first season of Learn Videography where there's mis- miscommunication between me as a producer and a background talent. Where, you know, on the release forms and everything, we said it was a net 30. Um, I don't need to get into it. But long story short, the payment arrived net 30. And, and he had a lawyer, just like you said, that, you know, mm-hmm. if you're one day past the entertainment co- code or whatever, they'll go and sue you. And I went through that process and it was terrible, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, and a background extra that we were paying 250 a day was trying to sue for $3,500 uh, in damages wow. and whatnot. Uh, and you don't want to take that on as a business owner, you know, like this is a business, this is a professional and you're dealing with labor laws and stuff like that. So you need to be aware of that. The permit stuff too. It's, it's helpful to be aware of that. You know, like oh, we yeah. get away with so much as content creators, we're just like, Hey, we got a small crew and stuff, but um, you don't want to get turned down. If you're with a big client, you don't want to, you know, get pushed yeah. away or get fined or anything. But I want to quickly get back on the social assets topic with you because you're doing so many awesome mm-hmm videos for social, TikTok, et cetera. What kind of deliverables are you delivering these days? Like when you work with a, a client, mm-hmm. like what are you giving them these days um, and what that package yeah. looks like? 
So if I'm working with an e-com brand and, you know, they're just selling a product, uh, typically if we go into a shoot, I did actually did a shoot on Monday and what I'm delivering to them is we're doing just your basic like Facebook ads. So anywhere between seven and 15 seconds long, um, we're doing a batch of 10 of those and wow. all different. Each bit, all different. Some of them will. Well, yeah. So basically, even before these shoots, I will structure it out. We'll do because um, all these ads are based around um, a lot of them are based around text animation. So if I know the copy that's going to be used for these videos, I can build out a very specific shot list mm-hmm. based around what we're going to shoot. Right. Anyone listening? Guys, sh- make shot lists. <laughs> going to save your life. Like know what you're shooting before you get in there. Yes. Uh, conceptualize all that out. So I get, you know, so I get on on the set, we'll do those 10 different ad sets. And yes, the majority of them are different. Sometimes I'll uh, use some of the same footage mm-hmm. um, for some of the Makes ads. Sense. And then that's typically delivered in like 10 by 10 square ratio. Okay. And then I also deliver, I deliver those also in four by five for Instagram feed. And then I okay. typically deliver those also in um, vertical for stories. So they're getting okay. 10 unique ads ten, and then uh, three different ways. So def- technically 30 different options. But then also like, I mean, there's, it, it really just depends on also like how many days the client's willing to bill or pay me for editing. Cause I mean, like I could, you know, I could take a full shoot and I could give them so many different ad sets. Actually, there was a time that I worked for a client um, and I'll say their names. This isn't an issue. So I, was, I shot, I campaign for cuts clothing and love those guys. Um, luckily I've been able to do a handful of different campaigns with them. And they asked, Hey, can we have the raw footage? And typically, mm-hmm. uh, typically I don't hand over raw footage. You know, typically if they do, then I actually mm-hmm. have a fee. I have a fee for that hard drive. Um, mm-hmm. but have loved cuts. They've always been extremely supportive of me and my career. So I was like, guys, like just take it. Um, and I was chatting with them like a week later and they had just brought on their, I think he was an intern at this point, but now he's just, he's killing it. He's running all their creative right now, I believe. But he had taken the footage and he had made over a hundred ad sets, like a hundred, hundred <laughs> ads from, from it. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, which I learned a lot from obviously Yeah. where I learned I'm probably not going to do that again. Because yeah. I ended up probably losing some money. But at the same time, since it was cuts, I was fine with it. I love what Steven has yeah. done with that brand. I mean, it's, they've, they're just destroying their competition. I love seeing it. So that specific mm-hmm. brand didn't have an issue. But I learned, like, really the power of having raw content, you know, and having someone, if a brand has an in-house editor, like, dude, they're going to recycle that footage over and over and over. Mm-hmm. And... I could also get into the importance of having licensing agreements and when does that license expire? How much should you charge to relicense that footage? You know, there's Let's all get that into stuff. It. Let's and get into yeah, it. So, we don't talk so, about that much. I would love to, yeah, like raw footage. Like, do you charge for that? How do you license this? Like break it down for us. Yeah. So producer it, over here it, is getting excited. Let's go, <laughs> man. It gets, it gets tricky. And I would, you know, I think it's hard because it, it does kind of vary client to client. If it's a, if it's a brand that I've been working with for a really long time and I, I really, I'm behind their vision. If I also know that like we have a great connection and I know that I'm probably going to be directing campaigns for them for years to come, I'm always extremely generous. Actually, one of my mentors over the last few years, um, he's, he's always just hammered into my head. He's like, dude, he's like, just be generous. Like Mm -hmm. don't, don't get crazy with licensing agreements, stuff like that. Um, but on the flip side, you have to have some boundaries to it. Right. Because, dude, I still see some ads that I made like when I first started, which I can't believe some of these brands are still using like four years ago. And Mm -hmm. I still see those ads Mm -hmm. and I didn't have any licensing agreements on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, technically they're, I'm, I, I'm not being hired by them nearly as much as I would if I would have mm-hmm. had a licensing agreement on it. So now um, on some brands, what I'll do is I'll do a 12 month license where I'll say, here's the ads. If you want to use them after 12 months, um, I will have a set amount of money that they, to re up those ads, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll do that. And then um, 
with can you give photos? me just ballpark like yeah yeah with that so thing? yeah so if i'm doing uh, let me break this down and you know as a producer and you as a director it's like budgets and stuff vary a lot dependent on sure. every project the <laughs> every and, project, and the right. client differs so, too so just ballpark yeah, so I think like if a brain and it depends on how many ads they wanted to re up with me. So mm-hmm. like let's just say a brain was like, Joseph, we have this ad that's absolutely crushing it. Like honestly, I'll typically have them re up for anywhere between a thousand or two thousand dollars for that ad. Because if a brand's wanting to come back and re up a fifteen second ad that's been running for twelve months, I mean, you they're probably making hundreds of thousands of dollars off of it. Mm-hmm. I could probably charge more, but like in the grand scheme of things, like it's more of, for me, it's not even so much about the money. It's about like making sure I'm getting that connection back with that brand again. Yeah. You know, like maybe I hadn't talked to them in a few months and I'm getting an email. Hey, Joseph, we want to re-up this, this ad. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And then sometimes I can be like, hey, how about I don't charge you to re-up the license? Just book another shoot with me next month. I can get, I can refresh all your ads. And then I end up actually making more money than I would have yeah. just having yeah. them re-up the license. Yeah, um, I love I hope that. that makes sense. So, I mean, guys, for me overall, it's all about like, connection and um having you know a good working relationship with these brands i think if you go into a shoot and your heart is really like um if it's really to to figure out how to give them the best content to help them sell their product like you're gonna go so much further because i know some directors who like they're like they see themselves as like this true artist you know which is no no shame or hate on that but i just think that like I've seen them struggle because they won't get brands calling them back because what they do is they take, they put too much of their own vision into creating ads or something. And then those ads don't perform because they just got like way off track for what the purpose is. Um, So I'm a bit, I'm a big advocate of knowing the vision, knowing what the brand wants and trying to execute it exactly how they want it because the brand's hiring you for a specific reason. So just make sure you're doing that. Um, Mm -hmm. one more thought on that. If you want to get super artistic and want to give them something that maybe they didn't ask for, I'm a massive believer in, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, do that. And I mean, dude, brands love it whenever like they open up a Dropbox and there's a folder that says like bonus content, you know, and they're like, Whoa, you cut us Mm. five extra ads. Whoa. Like we told you we didn't want like lens flares and like sound effects put in but like if you just go ahead and do that if you have a little extra time this looks dope and they're stoked on it and then sometimes those ads do really well and then they come back to you and like you're then you go from just giving the brand what they want to almost acting as like a creative director for the brand and actually helping scale and um level up the brand visually i don't know if that Uh, makes sense but yeah it's just fun it's fun doing that so i I, I love that man um I think that, just that's the, awesome. the general concept of like under promising and over delivering, like just giving them something Always. more than they even asked for and just like making it so great that it's like, yo, but is that dude going to mm. give us bonus content like Joseph does? Like, nah, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like yeah. really making that experience special because it is an e com brand. They are doing 20 to 30, whatever, but mm. you want to make it exciting. You want to make it dope. You want to make it fun, exciting, like great for their brand. You want that to be a good experience. You know, and, yeah. and you make that happen for them. I, I think there's oh, go ahead. no, I was just going to add, I think, again, like it's I think there's little things that you're doing and I'm not even sure if you're noticing, mm-hmm. Joseph, but I think they make a, a huge difference. You know, for instance, the fact that you're providing them bonus footage is one thing, but the fact that you put it in a folder and label it bonus <laughs> is entirely different. Um, yeah. and, and I think, again, it's a little thing, but I think it makes makes a huge difference because Perception. I found early in my career I was often too humble sometimes to Mm -hmm. express or tell the brand how far above and beyond I went for them. And Mm -hmm. I think it, it, you know, I think creators are sometimes scared to do that, but I think it's okay to, to let a brand know like, Hey, I I went above and beyond for you here, you know, not because I need you or want you to, to give me extra money. Like, I just want you to know, like, I'm really invested in you guys. I, I'm I'm here for the long term. Like I, I want to continue to build and grow together. Yeah. I want you to succeed. Exactly. That's yeah. huge. And one one thing I I've been doing for my most of my entire career, which I learned this from one of my mentors, was whenever you're uh, when you're invoicing, 
especially if you've told the client, hey, typically I charge X amount. Obviously, I'm giving you a discount. To even push that even further in a polite way is when I invoice them, I do an itemized thing and I would say standard day rate billed for X amount. You get X amount. And it's like, whatever. Like you can say like, uh, cuts clothings, like special discount or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I just picked a random brand, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so they can actually see, and then like, even at the bottom of the invoice saying discounted at this amount, mm-hmm. and then them actually seeing how much I would typically charge someone and how much I'm charging them. And I think that it allows them to actually see the dollar amount and be like, Oh wow. He actually like, he gave us an $8,000 discount. That's crazy. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I found that to be really, really good. And he gave us a discount and he gave us bonus. He gave us extra, yeah. like we only needed 15 photos. Extra, he extra. Us, he gave us yeah. 50 photos, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, because also in but the I'm, world of e com, it's always like brands need tons of content to test on ads. So, if you only give yeah. them like 15 photos, like you want to give them as much, like as, as much ammunition to throw onto ads as possible because you want one of your photos mm-hmm. to stick. You want that million yeah, dollar yeah. photo. You want that photo that's going to make them so much cash that they're like, we got to hire Joseph again. So, yeah. On the contrary, have you ever gotten in the trouble that you gave someone a discount on the first time and then the next time you don't <laughs> give them a discount? You know, because you can't get a discount every time. You're like, how, how do you handle yeah, that? One? No. Yeah, that's, and I think that's kind of where it comes down where I can play the, and typically this isn't lying. I, I do stay pretty busy if they come back and they just can't up the budget, like Mm -hmm. I, I sometimes I'll say like, Hey guys, honestly, I'm really swamped. And this month I'm not accepting any jobs at a discount. Like these are my new rates. And even if they're like, but you get, you charge us this month. I'm like, a lot of times I'm like, well, that, that was a year ago. Like, yeah. Like I've, you know, yeah, I I've, I've grown in my skill sets. I also gotten better. I I run things differently now. Like I, whenever, yeah, now yeah. that I, I'm, I actually have a DP, I'm not shooting everything now. Like maybe I bring in another photographer and I'm just actually getting to direct. Yeah, professional. So, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you guys know in the industry, you're always upscaling with gear. Maybe this time around, I'm going to be shooting on a red versus my one DX. You know, there's different things um, mm-hmm. that might make that shoot more yeah. expensive than the first time. And yes, I have gotten into sticky situations and it's been, sometimes I just didn't move forward with the shoot and then sometimes i have a slower month and i'm like i'll do it and sometimes it's a brand i love and i'll just i don't know there's so many different stories of like sometimes they meet me where i want and sometimes they don't um i think across the board it's just like you just have to you just have to know what's right for you you have to know what your capacity is don't take on more work than you need to make sure you're never taking on so much work where the quality of all the jobs you're doing like sinks like it just varies month to yeah. month. And I wish there was like a, an easy answer to that, but, um, yeah. So as we kind of work to wrap things up here, can you talk to us mm-hmm. about what your future looks like? Like, what do you want for the future? What, what's, what are your plans for, um, your, your business, your brand? Like, yeah. where do you want to take things going forward? That is a, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I would love to actually have Shaw Creative be more of a front facing like agency. Um, I would love to definitely have, I, I'm, I'm talking right now with a couple guys about bringing them on, actually having some contracts with them as the, you know, them producing for me full time, or maybe having a DP who's I'm like, yo, I'm going to have you on all my shoots moving forward. What kind of deal can we cut? You know, mm-hmm. getting some sort of building relationships that way. Um, I would love, yeah. so I'd love Shaw Creative to be, a a i would love for there to be more full-time people than just myself and my wife so my wife does all yeah. the administrative stuff um oh that's nice so i i would yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so i would i would love <laughs> to have um i would love for me to be getting hit up by brands saying we want to work with shock creative versus we want to work with joseph shock because that it's mm-hmm. very difficult because I built a brand around myself where, mm-hmm. I mean, cats out of the bag. I'm about to say it. Most of the jobs that I take on now, I am bring I'm hiring people who have way more experience than me are way better at the craft than me. 
I'm just delegating mm-hmm. and making sure that the creative's getting done right. Um, mm-hmm. So, so really, so it's a like good leader. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know. So it's 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 one of those things where I'm like, I'm there. They think they're hiring Joseph Shaw, but they're actually hiring like guys who maybe actually went to film school. Guys, I went to college for two weeks and dropped out. Like my dad was like, I don't yeah. care what you do. Just treat whatever you do, treat it like a full time job. So that's what I'm trying to do. So I'm trying to get away from it being like the Joseph Shaw show and it'd be like Shaw creative. They yeah. have an amazing team. We love all the directors they have. We love their producers. We love everything, you know? So I want to get yeah. to that. Um, but I, it's a slow crawl and I have a lot to learn and I'm hoping in the near future, I'll be able to launch that and it'd be a little bit more established. So I'd love that. And then on the other side of things too, from a creative standpoint, I really want to get more into like high fashion. I would love to like, do something for like Saint Laurent one day. You know, I think that stuff is just mm-hmm. like really intriguing to me. I spend a lot of time on YouTube watching like fashion shows, like them setting up like crazy stuff out in the desert and like, you know, people wearing like mm-hmm. five thousand dollar or actually way more than that, thousands of dollars of outfits and they're just like on a catwalk, like in the most insane thing and or yeah. insane environment. So I think that stuff is really cool. Um love shooting artists. Cool. cool. Not the biggest fan of music videos. But Ooh, um, that hurts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I love music videos. I, I think you got to just... give yourself <laughs> <laughs> music I think videos. You got to give like... yourself more credit in the sense that. <laughs> Sorry for in- interrupting that. I got to no, give. You're I think you got to give yourself more credit in the sense that they are hiring you, and even though you're not physically the one mm-hmm. doing it, that's okay. Like you are growing yeah. a business. You are growing a brand. You hired these people. Because you thought they would be good to carry on your brand to help this client. You were overseeing yeah. them. You were supervising them. You were guaranteeing the quality for them. So I think this is just a logical next step for you growing this business. Mm-hmm. You scaling this company. So don't feel bad about it. Say, yo, I'm doing you a salad. I'm still here, you know, <laughs> but this is our brand now. This is bigger than just me, you know, because that's how things evolve, you know, and we're all going to do it together. So give yourself a pat on the yeah. back, man. You're doing really, really good. Killing it, bro. Love that. it. I appreciate um, that. No and, doubt. and lastly, man, Joseph, I, I, I guess if you could, if you could just share some some final words of wisdoms for our, for our audience here, our listeners. You know, what what are some some final thoughts to leave them with here? Hmm. I think. Um, licensing. Kind of going back to licensing. whenever. I, <laughs> licensing. Yeah, licensing. <laughs> well, maybe maybe I'll speak to like the people who are just getting started. Because I mean, guys, I get so many DMs from kids that are like, I live in the back hills of Iowa. I don't know. Some yeah. weird, some state, right? And they're yeah. like, I don't have anyone to, I don't, I can't, how do I get jobs? How do I do that? Whatever. And I'm just like, I can't always like fix your not having job issues because I don't know. It's hard. Sometimes yeah. it's difficult. It, it is hard yeah. living in states where the jobs are limited. Yeah. Um, but from a creative standpoint, I'm like, most of us have the internet. I'm always just encouraging people like, it doesn't matter what camera you have. You know, we've all heard it a million times. Like the best camera is the camera you own. So mm-hmm. like, you know, get Love out that. there, take photos, watch. I mean, watch as consume as much YouTube tutorials as possible. Um mm-hmm. You know, and then when, you know, when the time comes, you'll have, you may not have the experience, but you'll have the knowledge and you'll have the knowledge to apply to these jobs. Um, And I think that that's extremely important. And, and then I think like maybe to guys who are at my, my stage where we're kind of, we're still very new to the industry um, and we have a lot going for us if i can say that i think like set healthy boundaries learn how to exercise learn how to take a break (laughs) learn how to hang out like Mm -hmm. you know like i i have long curly hair you'd think that i surf because i live in california but i don't but i but i Mm -hmm. should i should surf Mm -hmm. i have no Mm -hmm. excuse i should be surfing every weekend or Mm -hmm. whatever you know so i think that like um we need I would love to see like the mental health in our industry, like get better. There's a lot of people who are addicted to working, addicted to um, maybe not knowing it. Everyone's just kind of trying to one up each other to an extent, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. results, addicted to results. Yeah. Addicted to results. And the next thing, you know, 
Uh, exactly. You yeah, know, it's like I, I'll get off like, with that. my <laughs> biggest job in my career. And the question is like, well, dude, what do you got next? Yeah, and I'm like, well, I don't know. Yeah. I'm trying to enjoy this moment. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's something that I've had a really big issue with is like not being able to like enjoy like the wins. Right. Even if they're like little ones, like it's just so important to be able to like, like, dude, if you, if you like crush it on a job, like take the next day off and like just relax, like hang out with some of your friends, go, go yeah. eat your favorite burger or salad. If you're vegan, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> like just <laughs> try, try and slow down. Also too, I think, part of that can be like value, value yourself higher so you can do less jobs for more money. And so you're not just stuck having to do all these little small jobs just to make ends meet. Cause I've been there too. And that's really difficult and it, it won't last forever. Like you, you will burn out and getting out of burnout is really difficult. So yes, um, yeah. it might even cost you more to get out of it. Yeah. Just cause you think, Oh yeah. yeah. More jobs and, you can't take any more jobs or maybe you you still are and create creatively you you just know you're not pumping out content that's like where you want to be yeah Yeah. exactly so yeah you just gotta take care of yourself watch youtube tutorials learn to take breaks enjoy life have fun and license your content License, license your content. Your content. 12 months, <laughs> two to three grand. You heard the man. Book it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> also, but well, yeah. also too, uh, I'll, I'll share. Give me, can, do I have two more minutes? Sure, go, two? go. Right. Blast so, like, I, I think it's just really important, too. Like, there's new cameras out coming out all the time. I, dude, I know some people who are just constantly getting into debt because they're like, if I get this camera, it equals X, Y, and Z. Well, typically, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, Whenever I wanted to, back in 2016, when I told my wife, hey, I want to get a camera, thankfully, she was like, well, you're not allowed to put it on the credit card. You have to pay for this in cash. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, no, how am I going to yeah. do that, right? Yeah. Um, so what I did was I sold used headphones um, yeah. <laughs> on eBay. Um, I won't get into it, but there's a whole process where you can actually buy used products from Best Buy. Okay. And it's an auction. So uh, me and my buddy bought these crates of like thousands of like LG headphones. And <laughs> so I was like, so literally for like six months, I was staying up almost all night, just selling things on eBay. And that's how I got my first camera. You know, it, it, so then I honestly, I'm the king of like starting a hobby and then not, not continuing it. And that's exactly why my wife was like, no, you have to work for this. And I think it's because yeah. since I did work so hard to get the camera, then like that's really just kind of kept me going because it's like man I, I put in a lot of work like uh i have like photos of like our one bedroom apartment where i had like hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of lg headsets like in our living room that i'm just trying to sling on ebay Damn. so i can buy my my camera yeah. right so i think Love it's it, just man. like put in the work that you have to to get that camera or that gear and like i mean I've landed some actually decently large jobs off that camera. And like, we all know it's not the best camera. So gear yeah. does not equal. Yeah. It's about the content, the stories, <laughs> you know, the results that you get from those videos, yeah. not the camera. Absolutely. Feel like well, guys, thanks yeah. for having me on. This was Joseph, fun. thank you so much. Yeah, man. Thank you. Yeah. So much knowledge. We learned so much about licensing and licensing and licensing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, and, and so much more. But I, I really love our conversation today. Uh, thank you for having us, uh, for joining us. And uh, for our audience, you can follow Joseph on Instagram at Joseph J. Shaw. And you can follow our podcast at Learn Videography and at Instagram Jump. And you can follow Kyle at Cal Visuals and myself at JJ uh, at JJ Englert. Um, otherwise, this is Learn Videography signing out. Joseph, you're the man. Thank you so cha, much. Cha, 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 cha. Go catch <laughs> Thanks, some waves. Guys. Find that work life balance. We, yes. we appreciate you. Right. Have a great afternoon. You killed the pod. Enjoy your night, Joseph. Oh, there you go. I'm going to take the win. <laughs> I'm going to sign, sign off. I'm going to sign off. <laughs> All right. Much love, man. All right.